because this evening's discussion is Stump the Sensei. And so this evening, while I'm the sensei that you can probably stump, I have the first team on backup here. So if you, if you stump me, then you get Ichishima Sensei. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and if you stump Ichishima Sensei, then you're probably wrong. Then your question is not a good one. <laughs> and this is what it looks like when we get together in the living room. Does anybody remember oh, yeah. that? I remember <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and we can get started. So ask any question you like about Buddhism. I used to say, don't ask me any questions about solid geometry. Uh, but now I've got to be careful because people can ask all sorts of other questions. Hold on just a moment. So who would like to, who would like to start with a question? James first, James raise his hand first and then, and then Mushi. Hey, James, you had your hand up first. So go ahead. Hi there. Thank you. Um, I've, I have been looking forward to this night for the past few weeks, and attest to that. I have been carefully curating all of my questions, and I've gotten them down to less and less and less and less. I think so, we're having some technical difficulty. I'm losing you. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. James. Okay. <laughs> um, all righty. So, uh, my first question, which hopefully won't be too, too tough. Um, one of the tenets is I'm to understand it about Tendai is that ultimately we are awakened now. And that's in reference to the Buddha nature and the doctrine of original enlightenment. So my question is, what is the purpose of practice? Okay. That's a great question. And hello, Maria. I see you Good down in the corner Maria. there. Um, that's a great question. And there's several answers to it. And the first answer is that while the awakening resides within you, you're not necessarily aware of it. Okay. And so imagine that the, the analogy that I use is imagine that you have a veil over your face. Right. That's hiding you from the nature of reality out there. And various practices remove that veil so that you can see into the, what the nature of reality is. So the awakening while it's there is not necessarily apparent to you. And it's something that you've got to look for. I figured as much. I just, I, I mean, that's, to... that's the, sh that's the short, that's the short right, answer. Right. Yeah. And, and I didn't, I, I didn't want to come off as rude either. I, I was, I was genuinely curious and right. uh, I know that for Soto uh, Zen that apparently I learned uh, this week that that question is pretty much what he asked and it's what caused him to. You mean Dogen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was, I was just interesting, it, it, interested in what the answer to that would actually be. So, and it, okay, I'm, I'm just going to leave that one there. <laughs> for okay. The moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to. You, you apparently have a couple of questions, so I answer the first one. What, I'll give you one more for now, and then I'll go to somebody else, and we'll come back later. How's that? Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Go ahead. Um. Uh, the other one is how as a husband as a householder with a pretty you know uh nine to five strenuous type of life um, <laughs> um my i want to put together a practice that i can you know kind of live every day so for the busy householder what kind of practice would you suggest? The one that works. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I, and and I don't mean to be flippant when I say that. You know, our 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 days is not are not as regulated if you have if you have a family and you have children and demands right. come yes. up and you know that sort of thing. And that's understandable. So you want to start with something that's doable. Right. And you want to do something that's doable. So, you know, there are many different types of practice. There's chanting practice and there's sitting practice and there's, you know, uh, calligraphy practice, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And you want to do something, pick something that you could do like in 20 minutes. Yep. As a practice, as an example. Mm -hmm. And then think of something else when you have the time, let's say in the evening time, you have some free time. Now might be a good time when the kids are in bed or other things are, have slowed down. And now would be a good time to maybe read Sutra as right. an example, mm -hmm. you know, so do it in, in segments that you, that are doable and allow yourself the opportunity not to beat yourself up when you can't do it, but to be as diligent as you can, when you can do it. Thank you. Thank you okay. so, so much. And why don't we go on to, to Mushin, and then I have a couple of other hands up. So I'll go to Mushin next, and then Maynard, and hey. somebody else had a hand up. Hey, hey. Hold on a second. Um, Mushin, yeah, go ahead. My, my question is for Ichishima Sensei, who, who's on the telephone at the moment. Who's on the phone. <laughs> maybe. maybe you can answer it. He mentioned uh, a of 500 breaths, uh, which I'm totally not familiar with. I presume it's uh, shamanta. It's a way of doing shamanta. Yes. Uh, and uh, I wanted to know, is this done on Mount Hie? Have we ever learned it? Uh, it well, I can tell you that I've never taught it. And the okay, reason, I and the reason so. that I don't taught, teach it is because I think that doing the practice where we recite, what we we count the breaths, maybe yeah. ten times, then start again, right, is easier to do. But it has a similar intent. The idea of the five hundred is it fills a certain period of time, uh -huh. cool. and the five thousand. So that's why it's in in those numbers. And I haven't I, I haven't taught it just because I don't think it's as applicable today as doing the 10 breaths, you know, multiple times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that, is this practice done on Mount Hie on the, when you meditate? You mean the 500? Yeah. For that, for that, you've got to ask Ichishima Sensei. Okay. Sensei, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Just, uh, I had a telephone call from sure. our congregation. So, what okay. was, what, I was I was asking about you mentioned the a practice of five hundred breaths. Ah ha ha ha! And that I, is, uh, I'd never uh, heard of that. And, oh uh, yeah. I, I and, he, well, and he uh, wants to, also he wants excuse me, Sensei. He also wants to know if it's uh, practiced on Mount Hie. Yeah, um, Mount Hie. Uh, not, not, you see, uh, they have. Uh, of course, uh, uh, practice for sitting meditation, mm -hmm. as well as walking around the mountains, so-called uh, kaihogyo, uh, mountain walk meditation, it, or some, someone says marathon <laughs> walk or something like that. But, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, when we accept, uh, uh, when uh, people uh, who want to join practice among the uh, just lay people, uh, then, for instance, uh, Reverend Horisawa used to do the 500 uh, times, you know, counting, you know, because uh, susokkan, counting the breathing, this is very uh, uh, good for not to think other things because we just uh, pay attention to the inhale, exhaling and inhaling. You see, uh, when we count it from one to 10 or, you know, or one to 100, then during that time, we can uh, forget other things, uh, but, you know. So the susokkan, counting the breath, this is uh, one of the method how to concentrate. 
So 500 or 300, nothing matter. That is, you can decide yourself. Mm. And you know, to, you know, come and you find yourself. You know, everybody has uh, something great. And uh, that is called Buddha nature, maybe in uh, Buddhism. So, but uh, uh, we, we are not aware of the Buddha nature in our daily lives. So when we uh, calm down our mind and concentrate the uh, you know, meditation, then <laughs> gradually such a covering uh, mind, such a you know, kresha or attachment uh, are gone. Then you can find yourself as how wonderful you are. So from the very beginning, such, such a Buddha nature is there in your body or in your body and mind. Uh, so that is a basic teaching of Ekayana or one vehicle teaching. Everybody can be uh, attained uh, to the enlightenment. So the uh, Mount He or well, Tendai Buddhism, unique one is uh, original thought of enlightenment or a primordial enlightenment. Everybody has, even, even a tree or grasses and nature, they have such a nature. So uh, when we, maybe pro uh, probably uh, when the Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years ago, he awakened in the truth uh, during the meditation. And uh, uh, after meditation, he realized that uh, how wonderful it is. Uh, you know, the universe and myself is oneness. That kind of things is discussed in the Abhatansaka Sutra, Flower Ornament Sutra, Kengongyo. And uh, such things uh, maybe he understood very first, I think. Then uh, he, uh, some Brahman uh, comes down to him and you are really aware of the wonderful thing. Why don't you tell such a wonderful story to everybody? And he approached uh, uh, Deer Park where five uh, big shoes are uh, there. And uh, when he expanded that kind of story, one is with nature and nobody understood it. Mm -hmm. And so or he realized that oil capacity of hearing is very important. So he expounded the Agama or Dhammapada rather easier stories uh, of daily lives. And gradually the listener's mind uh, really the flow and reaches. Uh, and uh, uh, finally he said, uh, Nirvana or you know, Moda Sutra and the Nirvana Sutra, that uh, you are already awakened from the very beginning. You know, according to the Rota Sutra, they said that uh, uh, Shariputra, one of the disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha, finally uh, asked the Buddha, what is your purpose to teach uh, the Dharma for 45 years since you enlightened? Then he responded, no, 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 don't ask me. And so such kind of question and answers continued three times in the Rota Sutra. But uh, if I say the truth, maybe uh, <coughs> arrogant uh, people, like maybe PhD people, etc., around, they learned a lot. They disappear from this seat. <laughs> then Shariputra says, wait <laughs> everybody disappeared, I'll be here. So please uh, tell us the truth. What is your main, in, in, uh, what is the purpose of teach, preaching Dharma? So everybody is enlightened from the very beginning. So everybody has Buddha nature, etc. That is, I think, his basic idea of enlightenment. And uh, that was discussed in the Rhoda Sutra and so uh, uh, in Japan, after uh, the Saicho, especially in medieval time, uh, Honen, Shindan, Dogen appeared. They all studied their teaching at uh, Mount Hiei because the Mount Hiei, the Saicho's uh, uh, project was, you know, to establish uh, Mahayana uh, 
platform center at Mount Hie, it's so that everybody can enlighten. So uh, uh, that kind of things discussed there, I think. Thank you, thank so you, that, Sensei. Okay. Sensei, I'm gonna we're gonna move along, move along because there's a lot of people have questions tonight. Oh yeah, okay. That's why it's some some the Sensei Maynard. You thank had a you had a thank question. You, thank you so much, Sensei. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I was I was reviewing a short article on Tian Tai Buddhism mm -hmm. and the eight teachings, mm -hmm. uh, which consist of the uh, four doctrines and the fourfold methods. And of the fourfold methods, the first was gradual teaching mm -hmm. uh, for those with uh, inferior abilities. And then there's sudden teaching uh, or complete teaching for those with superior abilities. And then the third was secret teaching, teachings which are transmitted without the recipient being aware of it. And then finally, variable teaching, which was kind of a customized teaching, depending on the person and the circumstances. So my two questions are, one, I assume that we are being taught gradual teaching for our inferior abilities. <laughs> and secondly, if there is secret teaching, teaching which is transmitted without us being aware of it, could you tell us what they are? <laughs> no, no well, it's a secret. <laughs> it's a secret. Well, let me actually, Sensei was just addressing that very thing. That's what he started with the gradual teaching. And it, it sometimes is interpreted as inferior but it doesn't mean that the person is inferior. It means that the person is, um, that the person's understanding is contingent upon the world that they live in. And so in a sense, our worldview dictates to us what we find acceptable and what we find not acceptable. And so that's what it was really referring to when we say inferior, inferior teachings. It's not that the people weren't that bright or anything along those lines, it meant that they weren't ready to hear what it was about. That's exactly what Ichishima Sensei was just talking about when he said that the, that that if he, if everybody found out right away that everybody's enlightened, everybody's going to get up and walk away. Well, and I'm not going to. I don't have to stick sit around here now. I'm I, I'm done. Been there, done that. Now I'm going to go take line dancing. <laughs> Well, so, I think what you, uh, what you just described was the fourth of the teaching methods, which is variable teaching, customized well, teaching. Well, that's 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 part of what I'm. I'm just going in the in the in the linear fashion that Ishishima Sensei was doing it. That, right. but the, it starts with the it starts with what is called the the gradual method, and then the sudden method, then the secret method, and then of course the last one, by the way, is the perfect method, and that's that's the Lotus Sutra and the Nirvana Sutra. And um, you, there was a second question in there. So, oh, so the, the, oh the, the secret teaching. Yeah, the secret teaching. And but these are also related to the various um, sutras at the time, like the Prajnaparamita sutras, uh, like the Heart Sutra. And they're related. So the Avantamsaka Sutra was the first one. And the Avantamsaka Sutra, nobody could really understand it because it was so profound. And then the second one would be the period of what we refer to today as Theravada, which is the, the idea of the Arhat and the awakening, um, attaining awakening as an Arhat, and then moving on up. And then when you get to the, the secret teachings, now, now you're in deep, now you're in it deep. I'll put it that way. And so it really does make a difference as to what you can understand versus James, who's right beside you, or Jane, who's right below you, or Wheezy, who's off to your lower right on my screen on the Hollywood squares here. And so each of everyone has their own way of understanding it. And the person has to explain it in that way. Does that sound right to you, Sensei? Well, the uh, maybe you know the ten tai four four teachings by Jay Guan, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, reintroduced uh, ten tai Buddhism into China because in China around eight forty five A.D. or so, 
uh, Buddhism was persecuted, and uh, so the uh, uh, teachings are all scattered. So the uh, the King Wei uh, uh, requested uh, uh, Japan and Korea uh, to reintroduce <clears throat> again the teaching of uh, Tentai or, or other Buddhist doctrines into back to the China. And they, from Japan, nothing, but they, uh, in, from Korea, uh, Jaeguan or Taikan in Japanese, he introduced uh, such Tendai teaching, Tendai uh, for, for the teachings. Uh, I think uh, uh, the person you questioned uh, maybe read that uh, Jaeguan's, Taikan's uh, in English translation of Tendai for, for teachings. Uh, you know, four, four teachings. Uh, uh, one is a doctrine of teachings, or uh, the other one is uh, for conversion uh, of the teachings. How to uh, instruct, uh, teach that, um, teach them to the different capacities of understanding. The other one is uh, Tripitaka teaching. That is uh, all around the uh, textures, uh, textbooks of the Dharma, Zotsu uh, Bechien, that kind of thing is Tripitaka teaching, the etc. And finally, uh, perfect teaching, or that is uh, Lotus Sutra or Nirvana Sutra. So, this kind of classification so developed at the time of GJ, he founded Tentai around 6th century in China. There are so many uh, te text uh, uh, trans rated from Sanskrit into Chinese language. So he had to compile uh, to establish his own uh, way of uh, thinking. That is Tentai he founded. Uh, and the Japanese Tentai, uh, Saicho, he uh, went to China to get kind of transmission of Tentai doctrines to Japan under the request of uh, the uh, king, uh, uh, Royal uh, oh, the no. yeah. So, uh, eightfold teaching is very uh, uh, easier to understand uh, from the different level of uh, understanding of Buddhism. I think. So this is a kind of uh, comprehensive studies of Buddhism that was established at the Mount Hiei. The later on, uh, the Kamakura period, such a Honen selected Nembutsu just, uh, you know, the pure and doctrines, that is the best he thought. And also his disciple Shinran also spread that kind of teachings to people. And uh, while the doc Dogen, uh, he thought that is per uh, sitting on uh, meditation, that is uh, best. So that uh, like uh, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha enlightened after sitting meditation, so just concentrate sitting. Uh, Shikan Taza. So that is uh, uh, Dogen's doctrine. Or as uh, others, you know, Nichiren took a part of Lotus Sutra is the best, etc. So this kind of thing, thinking spread in Japan. So the basis is uh, from the universal teaching of the Buddhism, uh, which is expounded by Saicho around the early 9th century. Is that okay? Thank you, Sensei. Thank you very yes. much. Is that okay, Maynard? That's terrific. Thank okay. you. Okay. What else do we have? Other questions? And it, by the way, if you don't ask questions, then I'm going to give a quiz. And that could result in karma that could delay your awakening for many lifetimes. So just, just be aware of that. Um, yes, say again. So my question is... Oh, say again, before I forget, I'm going to see Yoda in this weekend. Yes, yes, I know. It's going to be <laughs> so, exciting. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, how can we spread the Dharma in the Western world without acting or seeming to proselytize? And uh, what is Sendai's role in that? I, I, I'm you know, to proselytize. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, to a very large extent, Buddhism, well, I should say, let me, let me restrict that. Tendai Buddhism does not proselytize. And the reason it does not proselytize, try to teach it as this is, this is the way to do it, is 
from a Tendai perspective, there are many different methods to awakening. And we don't have a, we don't have a, uh, what would you call it, a lock on, on, on awakening. And not only that, but when one begins to proselytize, then that causes all kinds of other problems. So Buddhism in general does not proselytize. It makes it available. So we talk about propagating the Dharma. It's like planting the seeds. And if you plant the seeds, then something will grow. But if you try, attempt to proselytize, then you're trying to force people to, you try to convince people that your way is right and their way is wrong. And now you get a kind of resistance. Go, go ahead, say again. So my follow-up question to that would be, um, what is the difference between trying to convince somebody that what we practice is, is right and planting the seeds? Is planting the seeds just like bearing witness the fact that we are here and uh, this is our way of thinking and uh, letting people come to their own conclusions? Well, to a certain extent, yes. But I think on the other hand, um, for instance, how did you find out about Buddhism the first time? Uh, actually, I found out through um, Facebook. <laughs> <Okay. Open. laughs> something super super silly i took one of those games on facebook and it said oh okay. you were a monk in a past life and i'm like oh no maybe i'll look into that and i did and, uh, <laughs> sounds fun <laughs> yeah, i well, found I, the religion super interesting okay well i guess i guess what i'm trying to say is that each of us that's here came across it in some way and and it, it, for me personally it, it, I can just tell you, it was because when I was around, when I was in middle school, around 13, 14 years old, I happened to be in the library uh, doing my homework, studying, and I didn't really feel like doing my algebra or whatever it was, and got up and went to the shelf, and there was a book on Taoism. And I picked up this book on Taoism and read Lao Tzu, and Lao Tzu led to to other things and other things led to other things and on and on it goes. I became fascinated with it. In other words, the fact that the book was in the library on the shelf was my entry into it. For somebody else, it could be they know somebody who says, you know, I'm going to this series of talks. Why don't you join me? That's not proselytizing. And you can walk away if you like, you know, that's, that's all it is. So I think that the, uh, the other idea, now I'm going to get a bit metaphysical on you, okay? So from a metaphysical perspective, you don't know that in the last lifetime, you were not exposed to Buddhism. And each of us, through our rebirth, may then make use of Buddhism because we've been exposed to it in a previous lifetime. That's, making, that's the metaphysical explanation for that. And, and by the way, you know, uh, I think I'm pretty sure it was Sensei who told me, who mentioned to me at one point when I was asking about, about such things and was laughing at the fact that we had a cat at the time named Sneezy, who when we were at Tamunin, uh, the temple that we, his temple that we lived at in, in uh, Japan. And Sneezy used to sit on the... Uh, the uh, the Raihan, the the platform in front, and he would sit there and stare at Amida Buddha, at Amitabha. And Sensei walks in one day and he looks at it and he said, "Ah, oh, this cat's going to be reborn the next lifetime <laughs> as a Buddhist." <laughs> Do you remember that Sensei? Probably not. Uh, sensei, you're you're muted. Just there you go. Do you do you remember coming uh, into sorry, into? I, do you remember coming into Tamun Inn and you saw the cat sitting on the Raihan, and you and you joked with ah, me? Oh, in the yeah. next lifetime, <laughs> he's <laughs> he's going to be the monk. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And the cat you brought to USA, right? Your, yes. 
Yep. You know, Karuna Tendai uh, Center. Yes. Uh, I remember. The yep, very we... fat uh, cat, right? Yes, a very big it, cat. Uh, <laughs> Tamo into there, yeah. New York. That's right. That's right. What other question? Did, did that answer your question, Sagan? Yes, thank you so much. Good. John, you had a question. Oh, well, I have a practical question. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> do you want do you want to know the volume of the cylinder? <laughs> we'll get to that later. Uh, if we have ants in the kitchen, if I put out an ant trap, am I breaking my bodhisattva vows? As a Tendai Buddhist, you're not. Oh, what kind of Buddhist is breaking his vows? Well, some some Theravadins and Jains would object to that, I especially see. the Jains. But from a Tendai, you're not breaking your vows because the Ants, or let's say you, you have mice, and the mice would eat your grain. And so in that sense, it's okay to protect your grain or your whatever, you know, in your house, your foodstuffs in the house. So putting out the ant trap is not necessarily a violation. So it's like but there are, there, are some, there are some Buddhists who would probably argue with you about that. But from a Tendai perspective, that's, that's usually not an issue. So we're pleading self-defense. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> was there something else or was that, that was it? Uh, that's it, I mean, you know. But, but you know, even, even the Jains are, are sort of ambiguous about that. Some of the Jains uh, will go so far as to um, wear masks so that they're not inhaling uh, bacteria and such because they're living, they're living creatures. You know, though I would I would suggest I would suggest that one of to me and this is just my editorial that we have to recognize that it's impossible to live this life without killing other beings, because even if you're a very careful farmer, you're still far, just farming in the field. You're going to kill mice and birds and snakes and anybody who's who's farmed knows that when you till the field you're killing many things. And so just living is going to cause the death of other creatures. Even if you're, even if you're as, as uh, gentle and kind as you can be. Well, yeah. I've taken the practice of always asking them to leave first. Well, that's a good idea, <laughs> I'm, but I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's very good. <laughs> and, and, the, and the other, the other practice is to, to recognize, let's say the, the the bird you kill in a field, to recognize that this bird died so that you could live, right. and to and to have a sense of gratitude in that right. in that of American uh, sensibility. Yeah, Choden, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, to answer John, there is a a poem uh, by the poet Issa, which goes: "Spirited, restive flea." Become a Buddha by my hand. <laughs> Thank you. Swift reverse. Do we have do we have any other questions? Yes, Maria. All right. So I come from a, I come from a big Roman Catholic family. And so some of the people in my family say that um, Buddhism is a religion. Some of them say it's a philosophy. Some of them say it's uh, heathenism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably all of the above, but what do I say to that? You just say that, that it is a religion, it's a philosophy and it's a way of life. Well, I say it's a way of life. It's, but it's, but it, but it's, all, it's all of the above, you know? And it really depends upon how one practices, and it depends upon what your definition, what one's definition of religion is, and it depends upon what one's definition of philosophy is, etc. But I would I would suggest that Buddhism is all three of those thing, things. It's a religion, it's a philosophy, and it's a way of life. Yeah, and the other thing is tell them that actually, um, when they think that it's that it's heathenism. Hey, we got a heck of a lot more deities than they had than you have in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, come on. Well, I'm not that kind. I usually say there are no pedophiles in Buddhism. 
Okay. <laughs> at, least, at least no pedophilic priests. Huh? <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions that we have? Uh, Chip, go ahead. Uh, like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, American Dharma, yeah. You mentioned this book, and so I got it. And uh, I've read like the first third of it, which is dealing with the mindfulness. Um, so I don't know what, what follows, but how did you relate to this book? It's so detailed in the number of, of uh, American cults or American variations on, on, on Buddhism. Did you, did you like this book? Or I, thought, I thought it's a great book. Maynard also read it. Maynard, what's your opinion of it? Maynard, you're muted. Maynard, you're muted. Yeah, my, dog, my dog was barking, so I had to okay. uh, I thought it was absolutely a fascinating book, but uh, you're right. It, it, it goes over the full variety of, of American forms of Buddhism, and uh, uh, it's both intriguing and, 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 in a way, kind of inspiring to see all the creativity. On the other hand, it's a little worrisome that there's so many paths for somebody an American, you know, trying to shopping around to try to find a, an entryway into Buddhism uh, as a very, very confusing assortment of sanghas and temples to to attend. And so I'm not sure it's a good thing, but it's certainly exciting to read about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's I would say that that's the short of it. <laughs> I could give you the long of it, but you, we don't have time. So. Does anybody else have a question? We've got time for one or two more questions. Oh, yes, Mark, please go ahead. And Mark, you're muted, so you know. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so I want to ask uh, some thoughts about what's happening in Burma, which is a Buddhist country and mm -hmm. now the site of terrible oppression. And I'm wondering any thoughts of how that can be reconciled. I mean, obviously any religion can be and be given lip service and not lived out. But um, any thoughts about the dynamics there? And Well, a, a couple of things. And the first thing is, and, and obviously the group that is most um, persecuted are the Rohingya. And the Rohingya are just one of dozens of minorities in Burma that are being persecuted by the uh, military primarily, but also by some of the Buddhist organizations. And so the attitude that I've had is to recognize that the, what is happening there is a result of ethnic genocide that we've seen all over the world at different times. And what I've tried to do here is to reconcile what we do in the state. So that a couple of years ago, we had, I teamed with a mosque in Albany that has a large number of Rohingya and invited them out here for a picnic. <laughs> and even before that, uh, Schumann and, and um, was it Wes and Tony and I visited their mosque and we did a truth and reconciliation with them at the mosque. And then the follow-up to that was to invite them out here and we had a big picnic with about, I don't know how many people, probably together 50 with around, our, fi around with 50 people, sangha. around 50 people, both Sangha members and Rohingya. Um, but to recognize that because one is, because, uh, and I'll get to you in a second, Jose, but to recognize that Buddhism espouses certain values and ideals doesn't mean that all Buddhists are going to follow those. And it's a human enterprise. And we just have to recognize that. Jose, did you want to say something about that? Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, draw attention to two links that I sent. Mark, can you see the links there? I did. The Thank the you. The View Project. Uh, arguably, they are the most effective and efficient at getting the resources to the local people with very little overhead. So you might want to check out Clearview Project. And then also on um, the... Buddhist Action Coalition website, there's the call to action, and you'll see um, some other links as far as how to help out in Miramar. Thank you. Thank you. 
So if I can follow up with that question, because sure, go ahead. in some countries like Japan, Buddhism is not a source of, of ethnic cleansing or a source of conflict. And in the United States, I would say it's not. So I guess the question is, is there a role that Buddhism could play to help create an environment in which Buddhism can flourish in the way it's intended to? What role can we play for the larger society to create an atmosphere where, where there's not that kind of... Uh, I think I think one of the things is that, and this is done by by Tendai. Tendai has teamed with the Roman Catholic Church. All of you who are lapsed Catholics, you don't have to listen to this. They're teamed with the Roman Catholic Church in a series of talks that are done twice a year on prayers for peace, in which they get it's an interfaith organization. It's not just a Buddhist organization, but it's an interfaith organization. And so part of the answer from, from this perspective, which is Japanese Tendai, and this started now, it's been what, 32 years, I think, something almost like that, that, almost 35 years, Tamami, Tamami mentioned. Um, it was under um, Yamada Itai who started this process. John Paul. And, John. and Paul, John Paul II started the process together. And so it's an interfaith organization because they recognize that Buddhists per se are not going to have much of a of an effect in let's say Yemen, and maybe the Catholics aren't going to have much of an effect in Myanmar, and so the idea of interfaith is important because it's recognized that all religion is a human enterprise, and working together we can perhaps try to um, come together to change things positively, and I think that right now. There's a uh, you do see some benefits from that from that attitude because people know each other and you can establish aid organizations and that sort of thing. So it's inadequate to be sure, but I don't know that we have a more perfect answer at this time. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Jose. A, a Buddha question for you. Yeah. Why did the Buddha touch? the earth. I thought you were going to say, why did he cross the road? <laughs> <laughs> Next month. <laughs> why did the Buddha touch the earth? I, there are several, there are several answers. So it depends upon where you look as to what answer you're going to receive. And one of the answers is that the, remember one hand was touching the earth and the other hand was raised. And one is a symbol of peace or to no fear, not peace, but no fear. And the other one was touch the earth because we're part of the earth. That's the answer that I, that I prefer to use, that not to fear and to recognize that we're part of the earth. Uh, Sensei, do you have a better mm. answer well, for that? Yeah, that uh, the right hand showing like this way, this is for don't worry, well, uh, you know, and the other hand touching the earth is, uh, suppress the mara or you know mm -hmm. uh, you know attachment or something um, you know to destroy mind etc so yeah. mm, don't uh, worry or uh, suppress the mara i think mara yeah. is uh, sanskrit but uh, uh, evil what, the, the evil influences mm -hmm. that's right <clears throat> yeah. uh, seishi you had your hand up were you gonna say something or just oh Okay. Was that a okay answer, Jose? Um, yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, I would like to advocate that as we move forward in the next few years with the environment being such a critical, critical um, matter for all of us as engaged Buddhists, that um, going back to the, uh, the, the actual root story, uh, when Buddha touched down to the earth for that... Um, um, that acknowledgement of his enlightenment mm -hmm. and how potent that is. I think that it is, uh, if, if I wanted to have an image or, or some sort of symbolism to represent the struggle that we have in front of us, that is just such a perfect uh, representation. Very good. Thank you. Does somebody have another question? This is the last question. Does somebody have a last question or should I move along? Let me go to the other screen and see if there's anybody that's there. Okay. No, no more questions. You're, you're sensate out. Mm. <laughs>
And I just have a, a few final thoughts. And some of those thoughts are that getting together and just opening up our having a, a stump to sensei night was also a way of just letting the Sangha see each other and letting the Sangha be with, us, with each other and to learn from each other. And I think that while we've been, uh, while the, the Zoom meetings are a real gift and a real blessing in many ways, they it's, can sometimes seem very one directional, unidirectional. And so part of the reason for having such things as Stump the Sensei are to just participate as a Sangha in an activity. And I think that Ichishima Sensei's uh, discussions once a month for the next several months will also uh, facilitate part of that. And I just wanted to share that with you, that um, we'll probably, whether it's Stump the Sensei or some other activity, that gives people an opportunity for two-way communication, I think is just very important. And I thank everyone. Historically, the word Sangha was used in a political context to denote a governing assembly in a kingdom. It is a term that was used then specifically by Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and eventually Sikhs. Around the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, the word Sangha referred to those who had renounced their family and had become Shramana, wandering monks and nuns. They were a community who every fortnight on the new and full moon would recite their vows, admit violations, followed by repentances. Moving along, monastic Buddhism developed and so the Sangha constituted the community of monastics. These early on were strictly ordained people, but the Mahayana Sangha began to take on a larger meeting, meaning it included lay people who were Shotpana, so-called stream enterers, and followed the path of Shasana. Today, Sangha is used to refer to any group of people who choose to call themselves Buddhists, Hindus, Jains, and Sikhs. Ananda, in the Upada Sutra, Sutta, quoted Shakyamuni Buddha, stressing the importance of friendship and companionship. That is the Sangha. He said, companionship and friendship is not half of the life, but our entire life revolves around this admirable relationship of friendships. When we have Buddhist friends and companions around us, we are more likely to develop and pursue the Noble Eightfold Path for ourselves. He went on to say, a good community and a good support system are very important to have good thoughts. And it is believed that while walking the path, if anytime you feel distracted or dissatisfied, Sangha helps you by reminding you of your goal in life and also helps you remain humble and offer gratitude. Sangha as a community helps everyone to visualize goals clearly and aids in understanding the meaning of life in a better way. And it is really very important to sit and spend time with Sangha on a regular basis. You'll be amazed to see how life changes and brings along positivity while experiencing life. The word Sangha has evolved greatly over time. And as I've mentioned before, I now use the term Metta Sangha for what we're doing at this very moment to refer to the community of people who are traveling together or in a specific location, which was its original use, to those people who are now in a virtual location, as well as those people in an actual location. When Schumann and I returned to Japan, returned to the States from Japan 26 years ago, it was with the expressed intention of establishing Sangha as an equal part of the three treasures in the West. It was our experience after living it at Tamunin Temple in Matsuzaki, Japan, that we recognized that Buddhism without Sangha was missing an essential aspect of the Buddha Dharma. It was our observation that the Buddha was present in North America, the Dharma was present in North America, the Sangha was being relegated to below third class status. It was for the most part, not a presence in the lives of most people 
who call themselves Buddhists in North America. This is largely due to a hyper-individualist society nature of our societies today. And as McMahon has noted in Buddhist modernism and Gleek has noted with post-Buddhist modern, post-modern Buddhism, this is part of the Buddhist milieu in North America. That is to say the thinking is, I don't need to belong to a community. I'm an autonomous individual who adheres to a set of beliefs and that makes me a Buddhist. Personally, I reject that notion. This is antithetical to Buddhist teachings. So we established Kronin Tendai Dharma Center that evolved into Tendai Buddhist Institute with our temple, Junzen Tendaiji. And we have a group of people who form a community at this location. And I was very hesitant to expand beyond the local Sangha notion. And that's one of the reasons we started the Doshu Soryo program. And that's a program of ordained leadership so that communities could have a Tendai Sangha near them. Maybe I was right, maybe I was wrong, who knows? However, the reality is that we now have a Meta Sangha. Now the question is, how do we best serve a virtual Sangha as well as a locational entity and be in fact a Sangha beyond the walls of our temple? The next step is how do we begin to reimagine as a virtual and locational Sangha? One might ask why this is important. The reason is quite simple. The Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha are the three treasures of Buddhism. Shakyamuni Buddha created a refuge in the Buddha, which is awakening, a refuge in the Dharma, which are the teachings and a way of life, and the Sangha, which is the community and the assembly. Each serves the other in equal measure. One is not more important than each of the others. Further, I have learned in my 50 plus years of adhering to the Sasana, the Buddha path, that liberation from samsara is not done on one's own. It is done with others and in service to others. This is best accomplished with Sangha. Part of my struggle has been to shed my individualist cloak and wrap myself with the robe of liberation. And this involves interpenetration, interconnectedness, and involvement with the Sangha. As we move away from this pandemic isolationist phase of our life, we will be reestablishing our in-person offerings while still making our various meditation services, classes and such available online. But we will be experimenting with new and different ways to bring the virtual Sangha in greater contact with a locational Sangha. We will undoubtedly make some mistakes and we will undoubtedly hopefully make some new inroads in propagating the Dharma to those who choose to follow Shasana. This can be a new and exciting era of the Buddha Dharma in North America. Thomas Merton said, you do not need to know precisely what is happening or where it is all going. What you need is to recognize the possibilities and challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with courage, faith, and hope.